Tips when using lambs. Tip number one, know your lambs. So today we have uh, several stents available on the uh, market that are designed or intended for transluminal drainage. I think that the Axios and Spaxis are the only stents that truly qualify as lumen opposing. I don't know the plumber stent that looks a bit like the Axios, uh, but the Nagi and the AIX stent, these are really more bi-flange stents. And Anthony Thiel uh, and uh, I collaborated in a benchtop study a few years back uh, comparing the Nagi, Spax, Spaxis, and Axios. And in that study, the Nagi uh, stent had a significantly inferior lumen opposing force compared to the Spaxis and the Axios. What is definitely unique about Axios compared to these other stents is that this is endoscopist controlled. This lure locks onto the biopsy port, something we're of course familiar and very comfortable with from FNA. And this is a one hand, one device, one puncture platform. And at Exlumina, the company I founded and where we developed the Axios, we called this the OB-1. So here you can see the Axios. Um, and uh, that's because we were all uh, Star Wars fans. And this here is a picture of the original 3D printed mold when uh, we first developed the handle at Exlumina, this is over 10 years old. And you can see that the handle looks very much like the current handle that we use. So this has withstood the test of uh, time. So let's deconstruct uh, the handle now. So it's very important to understand the components of the handle. And we have two hubs, a black and a gray hub. So the black and the gray hub here. And the black hub advances and retracts the sheath. And I put that in quotes because technically speaking, it doesn't really advance or retract the sheath. It only does that when it's coupled to the gray hub. So when coupled, it advances and retracts the sheath. The gray hub deploys the flanges, the distal and the proximal flange. And then we have two locks for each of the hubs. So the gray hub lock here, and we have the black hub lock here. Now this lock is not on the hub itself, but it prevents movement of this black hub. And then we have the four steps that I think you're familiar with, and they are printed on the handle just in case you get flustered and forget. So we have one, two, three, four. One is advancing the black hub to puncture. It's coupled with the gray hub. Then we retract the gray to deploy the distal flange. So that's two. Three is retracting the black hub, pulling it up like this to snug up against the wall. And then four is to deploy uh, the proximal uh, flange by pulling that gray hub all the way back. What is key is to pay attention to the locks. These locks are the key to safe deployment. So this gray lock, as mentioned, it couples the sheath and the inner catheter. So the inner catheter is controlled by the black hub. It advances and retracts the inner catheter that has a tray on the end, it's connected to the nose cone and a tray that houses the lambs that is compressed by the sheath. It also allows the black hub to retract the deployed distal flange to the wall. So it really functions like a retractor. And I use it like this. The black lock, hub lock here, prevents any movement of that inner catheter during sheath retraction to deploy the flanges. So that, that gray hub here is what pulls the sheath back to release the flanges 
And that black lock ensures that there is no movement of that inner catheter while the flanges are deployed. Now, because we have so little room for error, we're talking about one or 1.5 centimeters between the flanges, the distal and proximal flanges need to be very precisely released. There's no room for error, and therefore they are released independent of one another in two separate stages. So stage one is release of the distal flange in the target. So we pull back the gray hub here. It releases the distal flange in the target. Now, as soon as that gray hub pulls to the midpoint to release the distal flange, it auto locks and we hear an audible click. And this is important as a safeguard that we don't accidentally deploy the entire axios lambs. In stage two, we release the proximal flange in the bowel or we can release it in the working channel and then push it into the bowel. So we pull that gray uh, hub all the way back and this releases the proximal flange in the bowel or the working channel. And here you can see the distal uh, flange, uh, I'm sorry, the proximal flange released. Now, what's very important and you cannot forget <laughs> is to snug up. So in other words, this is step three between steps two and four. Step three is a snug up maneuver and you need to do that before you release the proximal flange. Now, often when the space is already very constrained, then that distal flange will already uh, be snugged up against the wall. So you don't need to snug it up further, but if it is not in apposition with the wall, then you need to snug up first. If you ever get lost, look for the black band marker. This black band, which you see here, designates the distal tip of the sheath. And it's important to always know where that distal tip is. You need to know at what point you're pulling the sheath back to deploy the flanges. So you see this endoscopically, of course. So here's the black band. And you know that at this point, you're going to release the proximal flange. You can also see this black band on ultrasound. It appears black relative to the sheath and the axios, which is being deployed. You see it because the material that the engineers used at the very end is about a centimeter, uh, is different than the sheath itself. So it is not echo dense like the sheath. You see this black band. And finally, on fluoroscopy, this is the radio opaque tip because they use, they included radio opaque material in this black band portion so that you can see this on fluoroscopy. So you have three imaging modalities to control and check and confirm the position of and location of the distal tip, tip of your sheath. Tip number two, you need to know your target. The target dimensions, the target contents, and the interposed tissue. So you need to measure the dimensions, you need to study the contents, and you need to interrogate the interposed tissue. Target dimensions. We have a cross diameter A, and we have a long diameter B. That long diameter is the trajectory of the puncture path. The minimum cross diameter must be greater than the flange diameter of your lamps. The minimum longitudinal diameter, long diameter, must be greater than the runway needed to deploy the distal flange. And I'll talk about the runway in just uh, a moment. So we all know the lumen diameter, right? We designate a six millimeter lambs, eight millimeter, 10, 15, and 20. 
What we don't necessarily know is the flange diameter. Well, as a general ballpark rule, the flange diameter is about two times the lumen diameter. But in fact, if you measure it out, uh, it is less than two times. And as you get to a larger lumen diameter, that multiple decreases. So when you place a 20 millimeter lambs, that's the lumen diameter, the flange diameter is 29. So it's about 1.5 times. If you place a six millimeter lambs, the flange diameter is 10 millimeters. So just sort of keep that in mind as you calculate the approximate flange diameter, you wanna make sure that the lumen, that the diameter that you measure here of your target is greater than the flange diameter. Now, more important is the longitudinal diameter. So this is the runway for distal flange deployment. So it doesn't matter whether you use the push or the pull technique, you need this runway to release the distal flange from the tray of your inner catheter. And if you're using, for example, a 10 millimeter axios, that runway is 32 millimeters. You can measure it here, 32 millimeters. That's the runway needed to deploy the distal flange. If you're using a 20 millimeter lambs, then the runway is 38 millimeters. So you need to measure that on your target to be sure you have enough room to fully deploy that distal flange. Otherwise, that distal flange could partially deploy in the space between your target and the ball wall. The longitudinal diameter is what determines the lamb size that you select. So the minimum runway would be 20 millimeters. That's if you use a six millimeter lambs in the bile duct, you have to have at least two centimeters. So that's really why when you're measuring out the bile duct, you need to be very careful that you have enough room to deploy that distal flange. Target contents. Well, you need a sufficient pocket of liquid for distal flange deployment. That pocket of fluid, that needs to be truly fluid and not solid material or semi-solid. It needs to be fluid. You need to avoid thermal contact with Anything that shadows, that's solid and shadows, that's calcium. That contains calcium, a stone, for example, or a wand often has calcified uh, components. That calcium absorbs current, so you may not be able to penetrate. And you need to select a lamb size that's proportionate to the contents that require drainage. So if you're draining a wand with lots of necroses, then you need the largest lumen diameter, which is a 20. Now, if you have gallbladder stones, you want those stones to maybe pass or even to pass your endoscope through the lambs to perform lithotripsy. So you're going to need a 15 millimeter. I, I haven't used 20 millimeter in, gallbl in the gallbladder, but I often use a 15. To optimize your target, pre-infuse saline. It's very simple to do. You just have to be sure, take precaution, that you do not accidentally put gas inside of your target because that creates acoustic shadowing, an artifact. Use a 19 gauge FNA needle primed with saline. So here you can see your syringe attached, attached to the FNA needle and you've primed it with saline. Then after you puncture, you can hook up to a water pump and you can start infusing the water, the saline, sterile saline and you infuse it until you achieve the desired target size. So here's a contracted gallbladder. This patient had a cholecystostomy tube. So usually the gallbladder is contracted and uh, you uh, need to distend it. So you can maybe distend it through the cholecystostomy tube, but alternatively, if you can't do that, you can puncture and then here through the FNA needle, the 19 gauge, I'm filling this with saline and then you can deploy your axios in that new space that you've created. The interposed tissue you need to interrogate and you need to uh, 
turn on your Doppler. So you want to know the distance between your target and the bow wall. And you want that distance to be greater than the length of your saddle. So if it's a 10 millimeter saddle, then that distance needs to be greater than 10 millimeters. Here you can see it's more. So you're going to, you will need to use either a longer saddle, or if you don't have a 15 millimeter saddle, then uh, you can see the distance here is just a, even a little bit over uh, 15 millimeters, uh, then this would not be a good candidate for lamb's drainage. Interposed vessels, you turn on the Doppler, you can see it, and you're looking at the trajectory of puncture. And then here you look at the tissue between the target and the bowel. And if it's echogenic like this, this is fat tissue. That means it's not adherent. It may look adherent because the target's pushing up against the bowel wall, but fat immediately tells you this is not adherent. So you measure and interrogate with Doppler in the trajectory of puncture and your saddle length needs to be greater than the interposed distance. Tip number three, know your cautery. Always use pure cutting current because you want to use the tip of your delivery sheet like a scalpel to go through. You want to minimize the, the thermal injury, uh, the collateral damage from uh, thermal uh, current. Uh, you can increase the voltage if you have a very fibrotic wall or the penetration is difficult. So just dial up the voltage but always use cutting current. Advance your catheter into the target slowly with steady pressure. I call this the three S's, slow, steady, and smooth. This is just the opposite of FNA where you often thrust your FNA needle in. Here, you want to go very, very slow. I think that's the most common mistake that's made using the delivery sheath to puncture like an FNA needle. Stop and retract if the interposed gas impairs your ultrasound view. So if you're getting any gas and you can't see your target, you have to stop and just retract a little bit till you get your view again. And look for the bubbles. You'll see these bubbles from the heating of fluid uh, as soon as you enter your target. At that moment, you stop your advancement. You don't want to go through the opposite wall and you disconnect your cautery cable immediately after you enter your target. That's just like sphincterotomy. I always have the assistant take off the cable as soon as I complete my sphincterotomy. And here's an ouch. <laughs> I perforated the opposite wall of the gallbladder uh, because I didn't stop in time. And fortunately, I was able to close the hole with a single clip. So everything was fine, but had I not recognized this perforation, the outcome would not have been good. Tip number four is you know when to preload a guide wire. This is something the beginner should, I think, routinely do later on. I rarely need to do this, but it is a safety net to retain access just in case something happens. It will deflect the nose cone away from the opposite wall, so you don't accidentally puncture through the opposite wall and it will orient the direction of the distal flange deployment in the desired axis. So for example, in the bile duct, I will place a guide wire so that the distal flange does deploy in the axis of the bile duct, looking up towards the hilum and not towards the uh, ampulla. Or with an edge procedure, I want the distal flange to be oriented towards the pylorus and not the fundus. So here, preload the guide wire before insertion, right up to the tip. And then after you've punctured, your assistant will advance the guide wire into your target. But be careful. Don't push too much wire in because that can push your target away from the bow wall. Now, tip number five, and this is the last tip, but the most important, know how to manage maldeployment and anticipate what might go wrong and have strategies already ready to, to implement should anything go wrong with maldeployment. So we differentiate these three different types. Most maldeployments are type one, two thirds, and 
another third type two, and very rarely, fortunately, type three. I like to differentiate type one and do a 1A and 1B. That's my classification, so you're not going to see that printed anywhere. But this 1A is where that proximal flange was not yet deployed, so you actually can resheath that distal flange, and I'll show you how in just a moment. But with 1B, that proximal flange has been deployed, so you have to remove the entire axios and then you know close the hole. You can start all over again. Now, type two, uh, I differentiate between the 2A and 2B. And with type 2A, a guide wire is in place. So you really could immediately place a second stent. I usually use a tubular one now, but you could be a second axios, maybe with a longer saddle, through the first axios to uh, bring the target in that position with the bowel lumen. But if it's type 2B, and you don't have a guide wire in place, well, then you have to remove the axios. And that's where you at least should make your surgeon aware that the patient may need surgery. Very often the patient doesn't, as long as you don't have a big hole there that's, uh, that's draining from your target. Now, type three, this is the type that usually goes bad. And this is where your axios is still in the target lumen, so it doesn't have a chance to close off. And it's just going to drain out into the extra intestinal space here, the peritoneum in this case. So these patients probably will end up having to go to surgery. You can resheath that distal flange. So this is just countering the safety measure that the engineers at Exlumin have built in to ensure that you don't accidentally resheath the distal flange. So there's a latch that deploys. Um, as soon as that gray hub is fully retracted. And that's what actually makes that click that you hear. So that latch is deployed, preventing you from advancing the gray hub, but you can depress that latch, push it down, and then you can advance that gray hub over the depressed latch. And that will allow you to resheath the distal flange. You just need to be sure that that nose cone retracts fully into the sheath itself. And uh, what I do is I'll look endoscopically once I'm back in the bowel lumen, just to make sure that the two are completely together. Because if they're not opposed, completely retracted, flush with the sheath, then it could get stuck in the working channel. And you need to know how to close holes. Uh, clips might work, but I, prefer to use the OTSC to close holes. That'll give you robust closure. And my final slide is to just emphasize that these are just marvelous advancements that we're seeing in interventional endoscopy that allow us to avoid uh, surgery. But remember, these high surgical risk patients who benefit the most from endoscopy, these are also the patients that will fare the worst if they have a complication from your endoscopic procedure and require emergency surgery. So that type three male deployment, that patient has to go to surgery, you have not done the patient a favor. And remember, first do no harm. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share uh, over a decade of tips that I have learned along this journey. Thank you.